ísť každú chvíľu. And we shall start soon. Okay, guys, so today's lesson, very quickly, we will move on high and late Middle Ages in medieval Europe. Actually, we will go through um, many of the states, so that's why I uh, call this lesson uh, like states of medieval Europe. Of course, uh, not only high and late Middle Ages, because almost to each of them we will mention even uh, like early uh, medieval uh, history of all these countries so the last lesson we ended up with vikings so very quickly we can go on actually I have to change the font of the book that i use many pictures from and the content so let's start with the medieval scandinavia N incorrect word for this is viking because viking viking in uh, nordic language meant uh raider a uh, guy who is like invading and raiding some other land so that's why pro that means that probably not many people were called like this that's why medieval scandinavia is a better word what you should know about this of course just like many others i will tell you about the ethnicity of these and of course they were and are uh in the european and germanic ethnolinguistic group the what i told you about the etymology of the word viking actually with long i but uh, they were called by most europeans and people who met with them norsemen people from the north and of course normans uh in the end today uh there are three kingdoms norway sweden and denmark and actually these medieval kingdoms uh or maybe like tribal unions were there at the beginning. So uh, I will show you. Of course, there were farmers, merchants, raiders, uh, and using these long ships called the Drakkars. Okay, between 8th and 11th century, what is the theme or the topic of this uh, of this history of Vikings uh, was between this 8th and 11th century. So you see it's like early modern period. John Green's video, we are not going to listen to it. This beautiful poster from National Geographic magazine uh, in my opinion, is one of the best I've seen uh, how to depict uh, archaeological uh, preserved uh, artifacts uh, found in, uh, in, in the ground, actually, because many of the ships were buried. So the size, uh, actually the equipment and also the dress code, which is, you know, in movies and pop culture, uh, very often like misused. And this is how people look like maybe in Iceland, for example, and how Vikings look like in Kiev and Rus, in Novgorod and, and Kiev, for example. About the cultures, you know, the stuff about runes, they know the script, but it was more like ceremonial and religious use. That's why like this uh, stone from Sweden from the 12th century says about great warrior who actually served as a bodyguard in the Byzantine Emperor's code in Constantinople. Five burials were mentioned by Arabic travelers and also used uh, in Kiev and Rus, you know, about sagas that were epic stories about gods, heroes, Thor, you know, this comic Marvel, Odyssey, I don't know, and Viking explorations. But for many people, later on in the modern period, they were kind of like fairy tales. They didn't believe that they, for example, sailed across the ocean to meet with some scrawlings in here. Okay, about mythology, I'm not going to tell you more because we got plenty of things so about the gods and so on and Asgard and various beings like elves, dwarves and humans, you know, even the Valhalla. But what is important for us is this thing that's the Althing in Iceland. Uh, this is the, the oldest parliament in the world because it's been used more for, that, more, for more than uh, 1000 years. And at the beginning, it looked like this. That was like a kind of interesting rock, a boulder, and uh, Icelandic uh, Icelandies were meeting there, and uh, their assembly gathering, and they were voting, electing their various stuff. Democracy is easy uh, to organize when you have big country to live. You don't have to meet your neighbors, and uh, they're actually like few hundreds people living in here so it's the, the other thing about the conquest and expeditions you need to know three things about three uh scandinavian uh kingdoms or nations or tribes dense norwegians and swedes because each of them were leading to other parts what allowed them to travel were not only the ships but even some simple very simple pretty primitive but still you like useful devices or gadgets and that was like quartz for example or simple compass uh, that was used only because of the shade uh, of the needle in the in the middle of a floating um, wooden plate or something in a bucket of water and it helped them like with navigation uh and 
last they could travel. So first were the dance with 793 uh, started with raids and invasions uh, in uh, kingdoms of Anglo-Saxons. Uh, to Northumbria and Essex, Wessex, Kent, and so on. There are actually two TV shows about this and this Lindisfarne uh, 793. Uh, the monastery was uh, called, called, like, claimed and uh, not claimed but raided for the first time. Then later on created their own like uh, territories uh, and uh, they forced other Anglo-Saxon kingdoms to uh, pay them tribute, but I'm talking too much about Wessex and uh, Alfred the Great, how he defeated Dance. But then, after his death, Dance again overruled England. And at the beginning of 11th century, as you see, Knut the Dan or Knut the Great was not only ruling Denmark, Norway, Sweden, but also in England. So England was occupied by Dance. Later on, uh, they uh, accepted Christianity, they assimilated, they settled down. And um, they went on in raids uh, only in Francia to um, Umayyad Caliphate and even in southern Italy where they were given land. So this is interesting that we have Normandy in here. Uh, we have a couple of uh, invasions and even we have Norman Kingdom of two Sicilies that was given um, to the Vikings as a gift as a reward for defeating Arabs and protecting papal state. So you see it's interesting in here. Norwegians were not so lucky for big land, so they sailed in northern Atlantic. They discovered a couple of islands in here, Iceland, Greenland, and from here even even America. But they were defeated by Native Americans and later on because of uh, global colding, uh, they had to abandon even Greenland, these uh, settlements in here. So this is Canadian Lausanne Meadows uh, archaeological excavation where Viking, with the Viking settlements. Swedes uh, were actually called with different names. They called themselves Rus, Rusi, and gave name to Slavic states that they actually helped to establish. Slavs called them Varangians or Variags, and uh, the reason was that uh, Swedes, uh, they didn't fight very often, but they prefer trade. And in Ladoga, Novgorod, or in Kiev, they established trade posts. And uh, later on, they were elected as the rulers of these states. And gradually, these principalities were united. This trade route actually connected uh, big, large rivers, uh, uh, and also plain lands where these ships were pulled, you know, on the land. And then going down the Dnieper River, they sailed to the Black Sea to Constantinople and became like interesting feature of Byzantine Empire that I told you about Kiev or bodyguards of Byzantine emperors. Uh, later on, when they accepted Christianity, the Dems uh, uh, accepted Christianity, forced other tribes to do it too. And for uh, like this high medieval period, these three kingdoms were united in so-called the Kalmar Union. Uh, they were also using like combination of the coats of arms, but it was like medieval kingdom, not Viking anymore, not uh, sailing. Yes, sailing, but only as a trade, not as these like raiders or pirates from this TV show Vikings, not very well. And actually, this is nice. This guy, uh, Patrick Animation, uh, he's got like nice uh contributions that how should the real Lagerta or one of the one of the uh characters should look like in real Viking stuff. Okay, you remember probably some of these funny stuff uh from the lesson. Okay, in this part uh maybe I uh, we move to this high uh medieval times and this is part of our western medieval culture again just open your notes if you can't remember uh, what is here in uh, about if you're going if you're supposed to talk about this you should speak about latin language of course we're lit clergy were literate uh, some things from the history of the papacy who was the pope uh, what uh, he organized like councils and uh, what was this impact on creating dogmas of, or so on? Inquisition, crusades against heathens that he organized and so on. Maybe some famous poles like Gregory the Great. Heresy in Europe, um, not so important for us today, but for French, for example, if you're going to study there, Albigens or Qatars were really famous. Of course, for us, the Kingdom of Bohemia uh, had this great and the only like surviving heretic movement that were Hussites. Monastic orders and monasticism, as it is called, is not only about three main Dominic, uh, monastic orders of Benedictines, Dominicans, and Franciscans, but also about building monasteries and how they work, not only in preserving uh, uh, 
preserving literacy and rewriting uh, the books, for example, and illuminating, but also uh, establishing hospitals like in Ilia, for example, and taking care of the sick people, especially in times of uh, the Black Death or bubonic plague epidemic. Uh, what I didn't mention, what you didn't have at the time, were universities uh, that became um, kind of interesting feature taken over actually from uh, Arabic Caliphate and from Persia. Uh, even Avicenna, Ibn Sina, famous uh, medic uh, physician, uh, established kind of like Palace University. And uh, this was established also in Europe. The oldest is in Bologna, in Italy, then in Salamanca, which was again more, it means like Muslim university. But then in Paris, in Sorbonne, you know that actually uh, we have two students. Uh, actually, it's not Sorbonne, it's part of it. That's the Sans Politique, uh, famous diplomatic school. We got Veronica Kvetko and Luce Gontko there. So I believe that you'll be prepared even better, I would say. Oxford, you know, Kubo Senech, she's there. Cambridge and so on. Here in Central Europe, Krakow, Jagellon University in Krakow or Karol's University in Prague are really famous. So you can just talk about them. It about medieval architecture. Be sure you understand... Um, the basic principles and you know the basic features and how to recognize them within Romanesque or Gothic architectural style. You remember probably these terms in here, uh, so be sure you understand them all. What is new? Lingua Franca, okay, so communicative language. Today it is English, definitely. Studium Generale, this is maybe a new thing from universities that was the name of this type of study. Scriptorium for four faculties. Uh, every university had four uh, four faculties that were for theology. That was the main one. Then that was for law because it was necessary for attorneys uh, in the towns, for example, and also for the kings and um, like noble nobility generally. Then it was philosophy, which was general like knowledge. It was kind of nobility or uh, rich burger sons, for example. And eventually it was medicine that was, of course, valuable a lot. So for many, many years, for many centuries, there are four basic faculties in here. OK, great schism. You know what is that? Investiture controversy together with double papacy or triple papacy with Canossa Walk and eventually with the uh, uh, with the, the concordate of Worms in Worms in 1122 are all the things how the popes dealt with the issue that uh, who is the, in the top of the pyramid in medieval society. So their power was challenged by German emperors and you know it ended up with Canossa Walk uh, in 1077 uh, where um, even the emperor of Germany um, respected the pope as the highest authority in medieval society. And uh, Concordia Worms in 1122 was the agreement among them, uh, among the pope and the emperor, that uh, the pope still has uh, rights to appoint bishops and archbishops in any country. It is even today. Contrary, in Byzantine Empire, they had Caesar of Papism. Caesar of Papism means that you have Caesar, uh, the emperor, and Papa, Patriarchos together. So that was actually the thing that the the the, the Patriarchos of Constantinople in Byzantine Empire was chosen by uh, the emperor. OK, so that was nothing to do with this. OK, what else we have? Council of Constance to actually solve this problem with double papacy, with triple papacy. But when uh, finally all of them died, so they, since that time there is only one pope all the time. Hermits Regula, maybe with the illuminated manuscripts, uh, what else? Um, are actually Oscriptorium, a part of this monasticism. Uh, I'm sure you understand them, regulations are like the rules. Okay, pointed arc, for example, side nave, rosette, uh, flying batteries, round vault, gargoyle, stained glass, so we, we call it trash, are all mm, parts of features of Gothic and um, in, uh, Rom Romans, uh, Romanesque uh, architecture. Okay, Gaudia Musigitur is a song from German universities that was also sung in um, the Mining Academy in Banska Štjavnica too. And it's also uh, kind of like a student's anthem. That's why you may sing it. I believe that you will have chance to meet uh, together. I mean, your class at least have another ceremony. So you will sing it uh, again, I believe. OK, what else do we have in here? Uh, Council of Gargo, Gregor the First, seven liberal arts uh, were like uh, 
basic school subject at universities in these four faculties that were supposed to be more like humanities. Okay, history was among them. Together, like compared to with seven muses in here. Okay, with pictures you remember with scriptorium, with symbolical Jesus, symbolically Jesus is handing over the keys from the gate of heaven to St. Peter of the Saint, of the first bishop of Rome. But Italy in the Middle Ages looked like this papal state in the middle, still very rich and, and important and powerful kingdom of Naples surviving until the 19th century uh, after Risorgimento in, the, in this uh, north, many of these uh, medieval republics, city-states uh, like Venice, Genoa, uh, Florence, all of them republics, but even like Siena, for example, Parma, Duchy of Savoy, Archduchy of Milan, for example. So some of them really, really important. Okay, the only surviving actually San Marino today. So this is Gothic architecture, bubonic plague, yeah, this is plague doctor. And spreading of plague, this is interesting that you see that well, uh, in Archduchy of Milan, for example, or in the Kingdom of Navarra, or in, I believe, Antwerpen, that were, uh, they just proclaimed quarantine. They closed the borders, and you see that there was minor outbreak of the plague. Interesting is that Poland and even like uh, Carpathian Mountains somehow managed, I don't know if they had like fresh air at that time or something like that, I don't know. But uh, somehow they avoided it. So as you can see, it came from Asia, from Constantinople, Italian uh, states, and so on. So and there was high intense, intensive trade. So that was okay. So flying buttresses of Gothic Cathedral, Köln am Rhein Cathedral, very famous after this. Uh, Köln, uh, Cologne was destroyed by American U.S. Air Force in the Second World War, still standing up. Not the a miracle as they believe, because as you can see, it's kind of a, like Lego building. And when the like wave of heat and fire uh, like uh, hit the walls, they just break the windows of the stained glass, uh, run across the cathedral, and goes out on from the other side. So they are not going to pull this the pressure. It's not going to pull it down. So it's just like physics and not miracle. As you can see, even the the there, there is a roof, okay, in here. So you can like pigeons can fly through the tower with no problems in here. Okay, work hard, plague hard. Okay, I don't know who gave it to me. So uh, let's move on. Medieval England, British Isles in here. So this is famous history because you're English speakers. Probably many of you is going to study English language as a teaching or inter interpreting and translation. So you'll have uh, exams from the subject. So be sure you understand it. You uh, be sure you remember it. Since the Romans abandoned Britain and original Celtic or Romano Celtic population, the Britons had to defend against Germanic invasions of Anglo Saxon and Utes. Utes will be Vikings one day, uh, and Anglos and Saxon, uh, Anglos from uh, Netherlands, from Frisian Island, Saxons from Germany. Uh, together they mix in this Germanic English, ancient English or Anglo-Saxon kingdoms uh, that are uh, in here. As you can see, Wessex, Sussex, Essex, all of them were Saxon uh, principalities and kingdoms, Western, Southern, Eastern and so on. Of course, English can merge Northumbria from Utes and East Anglia, also English or Anglic. Uh, kingdom. What you can see also were these uh, Welsh, Cornish, or Scottish and Irish kingdoms, and I mentioned them also in here. And they survived, of course, bad for them that during high and late Middle Ages, they were all conquered by the English and gradually they were assimilated. So only Welsh speak uh, like second language, which is Welsh. Scots can speak their original uh, language, Gaelic, Scottish Gaelic, only in the north and the outer Hebrides and all like all people can speak it. As, uh, Irish, for example, they have to learn uh, Irish as a second language at this in, in at schools because at home, like rarely some Irish speak uh, this Irish. So if you if I can tell you like Bel Cliathata, Bel Clydata is uh, Dublin in, in Irish Gaelic, as they call it. As you see, Gaelic is Celtic. For Ireland, what you need to know, guys, is 
St. Patrick and uh, his mission, Christianization mission of Ireland, uh, was very important because already since the 6th century uh, AD, Ireland is Christian kingdom and from there missionaries goes to Scotland, from there to Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. So uh, together with Francia, Ireland and British Isles will be the first Christian uh, country states in medieval Europe, Western Europe. You know, there were two days or three days ago, there was St. Patrick's Day, so that was celebration. Okay, Brian Boru, if you are going to meet with the only king who managed to unite Ireland because there were four or six kingdoms together. So that's the that's the point. Okay, the Book of Kells, precious artifact, which is actually like collection of religious texts from Ireland with beautiful illuminations. Okay, then uh, British Isles were being invaded by Vikings and the period when Danes occupied these Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, uh, so they called this domain the Dan Law. You can understand the etymology, the land of the Danish law, of the law court over here. Okay, okay, this is my favorite picture of this guy, Patrick Animation how these guys should look like, Anglo-Saxons and Vikings. Okay, let's move on. Alfred the Great, one of the great kings you need to remember. What I should point at it, education, culture, state administration, division of Wessex into shires, and every shire provided particular amount of, pop, of soldiers. Uh, and they had to train even like peasants and create fjords, which were units that actually were inspired by Macedonian phalanxa, phalanxes, phalanga. And the point was that Alfred Gray was a passionate history student, and he just used this ancient Macedonian tactics and to defeat uh, Vikings, which he managed to do that. But then kings of Wessex uh, ruled England until the times of Norman conquest. Normans were Romanized Vikings from this northern French uh, principality. They spoke French at the time. Of course, they had this tradition of Viking conquest, and, uh, but that's what, that was all. And at Battle of Hastings, William the Bastard, now William the Conqueror, defeated Harold, the king of Wessex, and became king of England. Well, there were also uh, some bio tapestry occasions, so we know the complete like course of the battle and before. Okay, reenactors. Okay, uh, William the Bastard. Okay, consequence of Hastings for us. Not only that, uh, Normans became English nobility, French became official language of England for many years. Uh, they started to build castles, typical towers. The Tower of London was actually the the royal castle, William the Conqueror. But one thing that Doomsday Book was the first census in English history and one of the first in medieval Europe. And uh, I believe that you have already um, inscribed your uh, your information. I, yesterday in the TV, I heard that there are 4 million Slovaks have already signed uh, in this census Doomsday Book. Okay. What is the upcoming centuries of French and English rivalry are actually have roots in this conquest because still uh, the William was still uh, the Duke of Normandy, that's the vassal of Kingdom of France. So for uh, the King of uh, France, uh, it, it meant that one of his dukes conquered whole kingdom for him. So he's the vassal. I mean, King of England is the vassal to the France, just like Edward I, the Longchamp great king, is bowing to the Philip, uh, the King of France. Uh, of, and from the point of view of William and the English, yeah, we established, we got new kingdom, so we are actually at the same level of the Kingdom of France, and still we have one of the duchies in, in France. So we can even claim the throne of the Kingdom of France and we can unite them. And this is what both countries try to do and so on. Actually, whole uh, lineage of uh, the kings in here uh, was picked up only according to famous, like they fame, like Richard the Lionheart. But then with John Lackland and 1215, the great charter of Magna Carta Libertatum, uh, was actually the establishment of Great Council or the Parliament where the king's power was limited. Later on, even more seats were provided for the towns, for example, and so on. What else? Uh, Edward the Longchamp, Henry III, I'm not going to speak about because there are many, many things in here. Actually, even the flag and coats of arms of England were taken over from Denmark. Dance had this uh, red flag with white cross, English just switched the colors, and also Dance had uh, three jumping lions, as they are called, and uh, English just changed the 
the uh, Magna Carta Libertatum, the Great Chart of Privileges, one of the castles in Wales. Uh, this is actually a famous one because uh, usually uh, Prince of England, like heir to the throne, had to have a speech and all of loyalty to Wales as a new Prince of Wales. One of the one of the episodes of the TV show The Crown is taking place in this Welsh castle, and for a great surprise. Of the Welsh and not very pleasant <laughs> reaction of the Queen Elizabeth II, Prince of Wales Charles was speaking in Welsh, what he had been studying. Really nice, nice episode. I strongly recommend you. Roi Edward. So King Edward, you see, still French is used. Very how okay. That uh, there was some there were some notes about uprising of Scots. How Scots managed to uh, seize independence. William Wallace is just one of the knights who um, died and became like symbol of the resistance. But later on, uh, Robert the Bruce. Uh, uh, defeated English armies for about two centuries. Scotland was independent. His statue in Edinburgh and uh, the place in London where he was executed. And again, how he should look like. They didn't have kills at the time. Of course, they couldn't use some Claymore style uh, swords and like hairy barbarian style. He was like nobleman, medieval nobleman. So nice thing. Okay, then England participated, started this hundred years war. Then you know that they lost. And uh, afterwards, afterwards, there was uh, a Game of Thrones war between uh, Lannisters and Starks. And actually, this is motivation for George Martin to write his Game of Thrones was the War of the Roses. You know, there, there were houses of Lancasters and the Yorks, both of them having uh, uh, red or, or silver uh, rose in their coats of arms. So that's why War of the Roses. For 30 years fighting, uh, none was victorious. The last Richard uh, III of York was killed at a battle of Bosworth and Henry the Tudor from the Lancaster family uh, found the last surviving member of the York family, Elizabeth, young, beautiful girl, and he asked to marry a beautiful marriage and in the Middle Ages in England. He established new dynasty. We know them as Tudors and yeah, Henry the Sixth, the Seventh, the Eighth, Elizabeth, Mary the Tudor, Edward the Sixth will would be all. And of course, Elizabeth the first were all the Tudorian kings or the Tudor kings. Okay, uh, some video we are not going to watch it. But hide and seek for the, uh, the that was explanation that the Richard the third tomb was found. A uh, tumba that is like a medieval coffin made of uh, uh, made of stone was found in the garden somewhere. I don't know what town was that like. Unimportant grave of a actually famous king. Okay, I'm going to check my time. Okay, so I got more than half an hour. Máte nejaké otázky, decka? Spýtate sa teraz, keď som si prepol. No, robím naozaj veľmi v pohode, Vika. Okay, dobre, dúfam, že si negatívna. A ak nie, tak sa rýchlo zotavíte. Dobre, decka. Uh, pôjdeme ďalej teda, aby sme to prešli. So, medieval France, what do you need to know again? Uh, uh, ethnicity in here, Romanized Celts, Germanic, France, Burgundians, and together they create mixture into French languages is one of the oldest modern languages that is still surviving. Of course, I don't count these ancient times, but French really didn't change a lot since medieval. So probably when you read, you know, Vika, for example, when I mentioned of Veronica, you had his topics about literature and development of language. So English was pretty different. At that time, Anglo-Saxon was completely different. You can barely understand something. Even Shakespearean English is uh, very, like, really <laughs> demanding. But French, if you speak French, you can understand their West Frankish text from the 10th century. So it's really interesting. At that time, still, there was this house of Carolingians from Francia. You know, the Charles the Great, Charlemagne, even English uses French version of his name but after his death his son louis the pius couldn't keep the realm together and the treaty of verdun divided this empire in two halves western and eastern and west part francia became kingdom of france you know later on there was also the treaty of mersenne in which two surviving brothers divided even middle part lotharingia so that's why even strasbourg and rhine river was later part became part of france but early capetian monarchy is called according to the first king uh, of West Francia called Hugo that established important dynasty ruling for more than three centuries. Actually, these high Middle Ages are typical that uh, many of these kingdoms were stable, had uh, stability and 
their families, the dynasties, were ruling for 300 years. Capetians, Plantagenets, Przemyslids, uh, Piast, uh, the Arpa dynasty, and I'm pretty sure I forgot about some important guys. Okay, uh, France uh, had a problem that kings were not very powerful, and they actually ruled only in small royal domain in, around Paris, and surroundings. So there were big, strong, powerful principalities that most of the time led pretty independent policy. And that was the reason why France was not very aggressive country. And um, it took them like many years to <clears throat> defeat their enemies. Of course, from here, Anjou, Aquitaine, Bretagne, Bourgogne, Champagne, Gascon, Normandy, Toulouse, which I forgot, Bretagne, Permandois, this is really important, this part of Anjou later on. Okay, uh, what else? Um, of course, uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes um, these Capetian kings managed to uh, centralize their power and uh, unite France as more as it gets. From these guys, I pick up only these uh, two, and that's Philip II, the August, uh, Louis the Ninth, the Saint, and Philip the Fourth, the Fair. Philip II of August was important for the Third Crusade, and he came back from uh, this crusade sooner than his rival Richard the Lionheart, King of England, and that's why he could unite it. So this is map. This map is important for us. Uh, Louis the Saint, when he died during crusade, was not so important, but this is important guy because his ambition, Philip the Fourth affair, uh, the last of power, led to Avignon Papacy and also ban of the, the Order of Knights Templars. And despite confiscation of their uh, gold and invasion to Italy, uh, he man didn't manage to have son, and thus Capetian dynasty died out with him. Then during the reign of House of Valois, English used this situation and weakening of France and occupied half of France, and hundreds years were started. Again, Jacques de Molay, the Grandmaster of Knights Templars, uh, spelling curse upon uh, Philip IV the Fair, and he shall die for this, and uh, he will have no sons, what happened actually. He had sons, but they all died in young age and uh, you know the hunchback of notre dame victor ego uh, this like disney version again <laughs> restored how it looked like in this uh, reconstruction hundreds is war for us is important what you need to know that it was kind of like big european conflict where they had their own allies both of them you know that for example kingdom of king of bohemia john uh, of Luxembourg or John the Blind, because in the last battle of Cressy, he was fighting, riding the horse, leading attack of his Bohemian cavalry knights. He was blind and they all died under the uh, arrows from this weapon, from longbow of Welsh and English uh, longbowmen from archers. Uh, French, they used, for example, crossbows from uh, Genoa, but... Uh, Later on, they had to change their military. Famous battles, Cressy, Poitiers, Orléans, that was Battle of Jean d'Arc. You know, the stories how she was also uh, captured by Burgundians, sold to the Brit to the English, who uh, burned them down. Later on, she became, like not saint, but like patron of France. But later on, um, uh, French managed to uh, build up their army, proper military, using also cannons, fire guns, organized military, and uh, they, they took over also some of these uh, English uh, warfare with uh, infantry and uh, a lot of like artillery around. And at Battle of Castillon uh, in 1453, the same year when uh, Constantinople was conquered by the Turks. So for France, for France, uh, that would be the end of Middle Ages, Battle of Castillon. So that's not John Dark is uh, Luke Besson's movie with Mila Jovovich later on. I like this movie. Okay, cause of English defeat. I told you one important thing, Burgundy, one of these last surviving principalities, finally decided to support their like brothers, <laughs> the nation, national brothers, the French, and they changed sides and thus they started to win. Okay, uh, what else? Uh, Louis IX, who was the, the victorious king, the strong centralized monarchy, and because of the reason of this uh, independence and resistance of many principalities, later on, kings of Valois, uh, had to centralize their power. Once they managed to do that, uh, they were strong, but they had problems in middle, in early modern period with reformation and uh, like these religious wars. So when, when Bourbons, when Henry the fourth, the Bourbon studies dynasty, they already took up these, uh, or introduced this absolutistic monarchy. 
Okay, what else? Medieval Germany, very quickly. Uh, we call it Holy Roman Empire. Since like the end of Middle Ages, it will be also called Holy Roman Empire of German nation. So there is actually no real country in here. Again, uh, from the Treaty of Verdun, Eastern Frankish Empire of Louis the German, because he will be ruling about the lands that are German speaking or Deutsch, Deutschland from Teutonic, was from Alamans, Franks. Uh, uh, Bavarians, uh, Saxons, uh, Falts and people and so on. Uh, as I said, there were emperors ruling Holy Roman Empire since Hohenzollern uh, dynasty of Otto the Great who managed to defeat Magyars. And since that time, they were electing their emperors. Together, more than 100, 150 domains, mostly German speaking. There are also some Slavic and Romanic, I will mention them. German duchies or kingdoms, Bavaria was the only kingdom. Actually, there was also Bohemia, but that was more Slavic. And there were two kingdoms. So you see that kings were not the, the heads of the state because above them, there was also the emperor. Swabia, Thuringia, Saxony, Ostreich, also uh, Ostmark or Austria, and many ecclesiastical states like Köln am Rhein, uh, that was Archbishop Salzburg, for example, uh, Trier and Mainz. Uh, actually, three of these guys were even electors, prince electors. Czech lands, Bohemia, but also with Moravia, Silesia, Lusatia. So they actually had more lands in here. Pomerania was like mixed Baltic and Slavic. Benelux countries were even Roman, uh, Roman speaking. So the Dutch, Flemish, Luxembourg, the Swiss, they actually fought against German emperors and created this union of uh, free cantons of Switzerland and defeated Germans, but not to provoke their enemies from France, Germany, or Pope. So they proclaim eternal neutrality since 1291. You remember beautiful stories until today. It's in here. Northern Italian Republic city-states had to fight. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was his, his only, actually, his main job uh, was uh, that he was military engineer of the Republic of Florence. So he built fortification and war machines to fight Germans. And uh, free towns in the north of Hanseatic League, which was trade union, Baltic Sea, something like European Union in the sea. So German Empire on the map from outside, as you can see, huge lands of blue color. But this is from inside. So this is how many states. And really, emperors most of the time didn't, have any respect and only a couple of them managed to unite them so the empire was actually weak and states lot of, enjoy a lot of independence and that was interesting many many of the history of germany led from this the spy country was really rich with a lot of universities rich states burgers strong burgers and so on once they were united it was really big Okay, prince electors were the guys who elected we call them courtfirsts or prince electors Volici, I know she's most prominent three bishops or archbishops for kings. You see that even King of Bohemia is one of the courtiers, which Czechs actually managed to have later on. They had more courtiers. Uh, they managed to be even the emperors. So Otto the Great, what I mentioned, he defeated Magyar as a Battle of Lechfeld or Battle of Augsburg, as we call it, 955 for our history. Really important because uh, then Magyar had to settle down and establish the Kingdom of Hungary. Uh, Henry IV was the guy with this um, investiture controversy. Frederick Barbarossa was the, the main commander of the Third Crusade, you know, that he died. But he managed to unify Germany only once in history that he could organize a raised army of 100,000 men. But they, they really didn't have a chance to fight. Rudolf I, the Habsburg, was first Duke of Austria to be elected uh, as the emperor. And he used these armies to defeat Czechs, for example, Przemysl Otakar, Odoakar II, at the Battle of Markfeld, with Karam 1278. Charles the Fourth of Luxembourg was actually the first king of Bohemia. And this is interesting because this boy from Luxembourg family, his mother was Eliška of Przemysl, the dynasty, so he could speak Czech as well as French. And he moved capital of Holy Roman Empire from Aachen, which was ancient capital of uh, Charles the Great, to Prague. And that's why Prague really beautiful and great town. And actually the only non-member non of uh, German Empire was King of Hungary, Sigismund Luxembourg, our great king, that he lost almost everything, but very powerful. And he was also elected the German Empire. 
he used these armies, but not successful to defeat the Hussites. He didn't manage to do that. Eventually, he was elected, but then he died. And also, when he, his crusade against Ottoman Turks in the Battle of Nicopol 1396 was defeated, he barely saved his life. Since the 15th century, uh, Habsburgs were traditionally being elected as um, hereditary rulers of Holy Roman Empire of German nation until 1805, when you cannot see it, uh, there was Battle of Slauko. Uh, when in the peace of Pressburg, Bratislav's Kimir, uh, they had to give up, Habsburg had to give up rule above Germany. Since then, the Germans were like, oh, come on, we are not united. So they started with the, their uh, unification process. Okay, so not empire, not the holy, not the Roman. <laughs> Plus, you know, they like the word. Okay, Teutonic Order, very quickly, only that that was Teutonic Knight Order from uh, Crusade. They moved to East Baltic and led many campaigns that destroyed heathen Slavic and Baltic tribes. Pomeranz, Lusatians, Odobrids, or Prussians were all destroyed. Lithuanians, Latvians remain in very small countries today. And this is actually this is the result of Drangnach Osten tactics like pressure to the east in which Germans from their point of view reclaim these lands that they they that had, had been that had been uh uh Germanic ones in times of Ostrogoths and Visigoths. And of course it caused that like many wars against Poland, Lithuania or Russian principalities in here. So this is how they look like, may have looked like. They later took over the name of this Baltic tribe, Prussians, and we know them in, even in 19th century as uh, the guys who used by Germany. Still many wars in here. The last one, but not the last one, but uh, the decisive one was Battle of Grünwald or Battle of Tannenberg. This is also mentioned very often. It was the biggest, the grandest medieval battle in, in Europe. So... Uh, if we don't count Mongolian uh, invasion, their clashes because it's difficult to say the numbers. So Greenwald was the biggest battle in here. Okay, Malborg, that was the seat of the Grandmaster of German Knights or Teutonic Knights. And what else? They later were divided by Poland, Lithuania, Russia and Sweden from the north. Okay, so what else? Yeah, nationalism. This was totally cross Prussians, Lebensraum. This is how they called this living space for them. So it was great inspiration. Adolf Hitler uh, really had this big story. And of course, for Poles and Russians, uh, even for Czechs, because Jan Zizhkov Trotsno, uh, upcoming Hussite commander, he lost uh, his first eye uh, in uh, the Battle of Greenwald. So for them, it was kind of like Slavic alliance, including Lithuanians and Tatars against uh, Germans and with their allies from England, Denmark and France. So it was a little like West against East type. OK, I'm going to check the time. Ak máte nejaké otázky, môžete sa pýtať. Rýchlo, dobre, 17 minút. Ja si myslím, že to možno aj stihnem takýmto mega rýchlikom, ale viete, že tie hodiny mám ich veľmi málo, takže nech si aspoň prejdete terminológiu. OK, so let's move on. Uh, realms of East Central Europe, uh, which we didn't mention. Okay, so uh, in here there were East Slavic principalities. As you remember, they were uni united uh, by elected lords of Novgorod, Ladoga, later Kiev by Rurik and the Ruriks, who was another dynasty of Kiev and Rus. All of them claimed to be the descendants of this guy, Rurik of Novgorod. And even Olaf or Oleg, uh, he established Kiev and Rus in here. And you know also the name uh, is in here. Uh, in uh, Boleslav Hropovsky, beautiful book, The Slavs, that I found in the antique bookshop, I found this beautiful painting of Kiev from the 10th century. So this is reconstruction, how it looked like in the times of Prince Vladimir of Kiev. Uh, Vladimir means actually uh, Valdemar, uh, but it sounds really Slavic today. And the point is that this was the guy who did, uh, chose uh, who chose uh monotheistic religion from judaism islam and christianity that was western or east he picked up east christianity so they accepted eastern orthodox church you may remember these great stories that he sent ambassadors to many countries and when they came back they reported him about what they eat and drink so they had to abolish uh not abolish but they refused they denied uh, uh islam because of not drinking alcohol and not eating uh, pork, meat, sausages, and bacon. The same was with Judaism. You cannot kill like anything in here. So Christianity was chance. And from two possibilities, he asked only like priests. So, okay, what are the differences? Like Virgin Mary and so on. 
I didn't mind, but how did the, the, the temples look like? So in uh, in uh, uh, Byzantine Empire, there was this Hagia Sophia, beautiful temple with mosaics and gold and so on. And, uh, you know, Romanesque small churches and rotundas were really dark. So they pick it up, pick up this Eastern Orthodox due to legends that only because it was more beautiful and you could eat uh, sauce, bacon and drink vodka. The The point was that uh, it was easy easier for them because... Uh, one century before that, St. Cyril and Methodius mission in Great Moravia um, uh, start to spread, start to spread Cyrillic alphabet uh, for them, which was actually like mother tongue uh, alphabet. So it was very easy for them. And it was common thing that, for example, in the Republic of Novgorod, even the peasants were literate. It was easy for them to learn like basic letters. And that's why in high Middle Ages, uh, Kiev and Rus uh, belong to mo the most developed countries of Europe, including trade, like life of peasants and also resources. But it was destroyed later on. The last of those powerful um, Kiev and uh, Rus um, dukes or princes was Yaroslav the Wise. And uh, they actually had the, this, uh, this climax of their cultural and power uh, development. Billini sagas or letters written on the birch skin, birch tree skin, uh, where the fam famous icons, mosaics, inspiration from Byzantine Empire. But later on, this grand duchy dissoluted into several duchies of Novgorod, Vladimir, Kiev, Moscow, or Galicia, and near our borders with very strong influence from the Kingdom of Hungary. But they had to well, let a lot of wars against Poles, Swedes, nomadic Polovians, Pechen, and certain Knights, eventually Mongols. Uh, so some of the battles in here, like Battle of Ice against Teutonic or, or Battle of Kulikov already to the Mongol invasion, that, who destroyed Kiev in 1239 already in such terrible scale that Kiev was resettled later on in early modern period. It took them 200 years to destroy uh, Mongolians. This Battle of Kulikov Pole of Dmitri of Don, Dmitri Donskoy, uh, was one of the exceptions, and only these new Tsars of Moscovite principality started to defeat them with 1480 Ivan the Third and later Ivan the Fourth finally defeated Golden Horde and claimed large lands. They start to call this country Moscovite of uh, uh, Grand Duchy of Moscow or Moscovite principality uh, with new name because they already conquered Novgorod on Kiev. Uh, so they started calling Rus again. And because at the time it was Byzantine Empire was already gone, so they even claimed the title emperor and even the third was the one who married uh, one of the last survivors of Palaiologos dynasty of Byzantine emperors. The other thing that Ivan the Terrible also introduced kind of centralization of power in this Russian Tsardom, uh, where he oppressed the power of nobility of boyars with his special troops called Oprichniks, Oprichniks. Uh, where you will see something like, what was this, Dementors <laughs> wearing black, yeah. Okay, guys, so from the pictures, arrival of Vikings, principalities, baptizing of Vladimir the, and his nobility, uh, Yaroslav the Wise uh, giving some advice and uh, symbolically holding a book, a temple, and a sword. But it was not enough, uh, still enough, for example, Novgorod defeating uh, Teutonic order on the Lake Papus near Estonia. This uh, is this Mongol invasion and Oprichniks who were like special troops of uh, Ivan the Fourth, the terrible with the uh, with the dog's head, with a broomstick, and what else? And a whip. That's all symbolic, like scaring the opponents and boyars who resist the power of the Tsar. And later on, Russia will be very strong later on. Poland, Lithuania. This is. Uh, of course, West Slavic Kingdom later on united with Baltic Grand Duchy of Lithuania. All these Slavic tribes were un united, unified by Polians who were uh, gave name to the land. Mieszek or Mieszko the first established Piast dynasty from legendary founder called Pianszt, and I try to pronounce it from Polish colleagues, and they actually. Uh, um, Adopted Western Christianity from Bohemia, from uh, from Saint Vitus, uh, who was brother of uh, Boleslaw uh, II, and uh, after baptizing, after baptizing Poles, they moved to Baltic Prussians. And according to legend, Sveti Wojtek, Saint Vitus, he was captured and he was killed and boiled 
in a big in a big pot and he was eaten so it became like a martyr and that's why there's St. Vitus Cathedral in Prague actually first king of Poland was Boleslaw the Brave actually a couple of days before I read that for many years I told you I have to study the, who was first king whether Stephen the Saint of Hungary or Boleslaw the Brave of Poland still for us it is important because while during his great conquest he also conquered Slovakia and Moravia for about 20 years then Piast dynasty ruling for three centuries was sometimes fragmented, sometimes powerful. They actually stopped the invasion of Mongols, but because of the decision Mongols to, to go to Hungary rather to like move on to Germany. So this was <coughs> pardon, interesting. And the last king, Casimir the third, the great, he had five daughters, no, uh, no uh, son. So he finally gave power to Hungarian kings from the dynasty of Anjou. Uh, still during his reign, there was this uh, Visegrad Treaty signed up between Kingdom of Bohemia, Kingdom of Hungary and Poland that established kind of trade cooperation among these three kingdoms and uh, also established Jagiellonian University in Krakow. That was, of course, capital of Poland. OK, then we have this rule of Louis the Great of Anjou, which they have Latin form of their name, not Anjou, but Angevin. So the Angevins is English name for the Anjou dynasty here in Central Europe. That was only personal union with Hungary, so huge country, but not surviving in Louis the Great, uh, had no son and uh, his only daughter later married uh, to Sigismund of Luxembourg. Uh, and he found himself a new wife. That's another story. At that time, they decided to uh, unite or offer to the throne to the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. At that time, actually, Lithuania was really powerful and still pagan. Uh, despite different language, they didn't mind that if they call, uh, accept Christianity, let's say from Poland, they did from Hungary. That's why Lithuanian coat of arms got a white or silver knight with double cross. So they would offer the throne of Poland to them. Still, there was exception that he had to accept the decision and limitations from the assembly of Polish nobility and towns. They did it, and 1386, uh, they created like huge union that we called Lublin Union, according to the place of uh, agreement of this union of Polish Lithuania. Poles started to call it the Rzecz Pospolita, that was inspiration from Rome, Respublica, because they want to show that they have Senate, that they call same Sniem, and they can limit the king's power and Grand Duke's power. And it was actually the that part, despite they won immediately, they defeated the Titanic Oden Battle of Greenwald. They even conquered Moscow, Moscow by principality. At the beginning of 17th century, Poles were occupying Moscow and they were, uh, they were, uh, providing new Tsars, Boris Goduno and uh, Dimitris, these uh, fake Dimitri Tsars who were all manipulated by Poles. Later on, 6 to 12, Russians uh, defeated Poles and, uh, they actually banished them from the country. But that was actually, that's also one of the reasons why they hated each other. Then there was big uprising of Cossacks in Ukraine because they were very successful against Ottomans and Crimean Tatars, but they didn't provide Cossack Atamans, chieftains of these Ukrainian warriors, warrior class members with their seats in the Senate. For that reason, Bogdan Khmelnytsky started big uprising in 1648. And they, after his death, they decided to join Russia then to be uh, with Poland and Lithuania because of the same Eastern Orthodox Church that Ukrainians had since times of Kiev and Rus. Uh, okay, years of smuta for Russians, but Russians in Moscow, uh, Poles in Moscow, so that was interesting. Last great uh, that act for them was John III Sobieski campaign against Turks to help the Habsburg Empire in the Battle of Vienna, Second Battle of Vienna. But in 18th century, they lost independence in so-called three partitions of Poland. So again, some pictures in here, kings of Poland and Lithuania, both of them in here, and so many people talking. Okay, huge country of Poland and Lithuania. You see all Ukraine and Belarus, part of Russia, was their domains. Cossacks writing letters to Ottoman Emperor Jan, Sob Jan Sobieski III, and Nicholas Copernicus, you know, and these are the partitions of Poland. Some battles of Lithuanians at the, the Black Sea that they man managed to claim these lands. Another picture from Battle of Grunewald, Battle of Ufa, <laughs> Russian principalities, and so they invaded Tatar, Kazan, uh, Khanate, also with writing Skis and many pictures in here. 
Shall I show it to you? I don't know because we have checks and crusades to go. I, I show what is this? Okay, so there are many interesting pictures from Polish, Lithuanian, uh, and Kievan Rus. Okay, style. So you can, when you Google it, there are like plenty, plenty of the stuff. So we're not going to move on, move on. Okay, John Sobieski arriving to Vienna, deliberated Vienna, but finally Poland was partitioned the Czech lands okay what to say about Czech lands just read them to understand Bohemia is Czechy Moravia Morava Silesia Sliesko Czech lands Czech kraj Czeske koruny Czeske so the lands of the Czech crown today unfortunately English decided English language decided itself to use uh uh Czechia instead of the Czech lands which I like prefer more than Czechia <clears throat> Sorry, Przemysli dynasty was uh, named according to legendary Przemysl, uh, the plower, the plowman, and from first ruler from this dynasty was probably Borživoj, who was baptized by San Methodi by Methodius, uh, bishop of Great Moravia. But later on, uh, new kings uh, asked Germans to help them, and they became part of Holy Roman Empire. Still, many of them managed to try to seize independence, like Wenceslau, who became later a saint, killed by his brother Boleslau, but even he had to be subjected to Germans later on. But their attempt for the kingdom resulted in the Golden Bull of Sicily for the loyal campaigns on the side of Germans in Italy. They were given hereditary title of the kings. So the first king of Bohemia became Odakar, Przemysl the first, with the Golden Bull of Sicily of 1212. Uh, Przemysl Otakar II, the golden and the iron king from the 13th century, brought the Bohemia and Czech lands to the greatest power, as you will see in the, in the map. But then, when Václav uh, Wenceslau III died out, the Przemysl dynasty ended up. New House of Luxembourg was chosen to rule in here among this John the Foreigner, as they call him, uh, John of Luxembourg, but in English it's called John the Blind. We mentioned him at Fell of Crecy, but before that he signed up this Treaty of Visegrad, important. His son, Charles IV of Wenceslau IV, became Roman Emperor, as I said, that, uh, they became like also Roman Emperor. So he became the great the greatest Czech in history in this uh, in this uh, famous TV show, you know, the greatest nation member. Okay, what else? Uh, but his sons not not ruling very properly. Sigismund in Hungary and Wenceslav the fourth. His son uh, was didn't care much about the kingdom, so that's why there was a terrible decline and no side rebellion uprising after Jan Hus was burned at stake in 1415, which led a couple of years later in the defenestration of. Uh, the Prague, which is the first defenestration where uh, the Hussite War started. Uh, actually, they ended up with Sigismund actually was elected a king, but later on they preferred they preferred to elect their own king, Yuri or George of Podebrady, but they, they had no much chance against our kingdom of Hungary under the rule of Matthias Corvinus, and that's why they read, later offered the throne also to Jagiellonians, and after they that also the Habsburgs managed to inherit it and claim these lands until 20th century. Again, a couple of pictures of the maps, baptizing Borživoj, uh, okay, Slavnikots in Przemyslit. Uh, this is rule of Przemysl Otakar II, and this map of Bohemia from the times of Charles IV, St. Vitus Cathedral in Prague and Charles Bridge and in Karlstein, you see Charles everywhere. First defenestration of Prague was from the city hall of the old town of Prague. The other second defenestration exactly 200 years later, uh, almost 200 years later, would be from the Prague Castle and not to the, the councillors, the mayors, but the governors of the Habsburg monarchy. Who side wars? What to say about this? Karolus University Council of Constance calls that John Hus, Jan Hus, uh, was burnt at stake as a heretic, and uh, then uh, Hussite army uh, led by Janzyska uh, refused Sigismund and uh, destroyed all the Crusades. There were many groups from Utraquist Taboris to orphans, but they started to fight each other. Battle of Lipan in 1434. Uh, 34. Uh, Utraquis won, who were moderate and allowed Sigismund to be the king. Strong influence with Czech Brethren Church, later on to Reformation, the Battle of White Mountain, the study 30 years war, and also later for Czech National Awakening, but even for communists, but even for Tomáš Garik Masar again today. So really interesting to read about how Czechs are open-minded and can uh, be like uh, 
okay with their different history. So a couple of pictures of Slavic. This is Gniezno, capital of Polish kingdom at the beginning. Campaigns of Czechs, uh, Przemysl Slotakar defeating Hungarian army of Bela the fourth. And uh, okay, Hussite armies in here and later even there uh, like raids in the surroundings of Bohemia, invasions uh, uh, or gentle rights, as they call it, to Slovakia, to Upper Hungary, and brethrens, as they call bratrits in Slovakia, surviving for many years later in the castles they conquered. Okay, Moravian Church is still like one of the Calvinist Methodist churches, Czech Breton churches, even in Jamaica or in South Africa, Sierra Leone, Honduras, as you can see, and great inspiration for Martin Luther Hus and Martin giving communion in both possibilities. I'm not going to tell you about the Crusades because there is whole presentation that you can read for yourselves. Be sure about you understand Seljuk Turks and Byzantines and Jerusalem as a holy city for all these three religions and only successful crusade, crusader states, night orders that were in here and how Salah had, you know, Caliph Salah and seized Jerusalem back and other crusades were not successful or they defeated Constantinople, established Latin Empire or later well, led against Fatimid Egypt or to Tunisia. Okay, what crusades brought is in here recommended movies some pictures again and thanks for your attention guys. Ha, oh, za hodinu som to zvládol decka, takže vypínam, uh, vypínam teda nahrávam. Ďakujem vám za pozornosť. No, uh, stay negative in test and positive in mind guys. Takže prajem pekný víkend. Ahojte.